starting. All right, let's start it there. Well, before we get started, I'm going to run over and share it from your page. Right. And guys, if you're just finding this, do us a favor. Hit that thumbs up, leave us a comment. And, uh, you just it helps it right. spread it out. Here. Shit. All right, we're up and running. <coughs> All right, everything looks good on this side. I think we're good. Check audio. Yep. All right. All right. We're live. We're good. All right. Let's do this. So, we're back again. Another Monday night. Get some fire live with uh, my uh, New York brother over here. We kind of look the same. Everyone thinks we're twins. Uh, Greg Michaelman from GMAC, Yo, Industrial you, Boiler Service. You guys, you do look alike. Like a lot alike. It's New York. It's the water. It depends on the moment. You know what yeah, I mean? It's the water, you know? <laughs> long island yeah long island <laughs> so um so greg actually lives um i don't know about 10 minutes or so from me and uh, we met here in apex which is uh kind of funny um he showed up and he's like oh i'm from long island too and i'm like oh, you live like 10 minutes away and i ride my bike past your house when i ride to the beach but uh so it's kind of a small world but, um, I don't think the camera's the camera's not doing it right because these guys they they look just absolutely identical. I have to get a like, little closer. Right? There you go. <laughs> He's so close to <laughs> the screen, and I'm all the way back here. So <laughs> that's terrible. That's terrible. Who knew? Who knew? We'd have to come to Texas to find my right. doppelganger who lives ten minutes away. And we're in the same trade too, which is pretty cool too. <laughs> Similar, yeah, for sure. Yeah. yeah. So, Greg, you're the owner of a um, industrial burner services company, GMAC Industrial Burner Services. What on earth is that? So, we it's uh, basically we work in high-rise buildings, so we work on some of the larger equipment. So, I call it industrial. Some people call it commercial. It's um, more like 20 families and up we work on. So, you know, multifamily dwellings. Mm -hmm. from zero to six seven floors eight floors i have buildings that we service that are over 800 families um but basically a lot of the big stuff big equipment big piping um steam systems hot water systems heat hot water everything the whole nine yards so Our specialty if you follow him on uh his uh, instagram and facebook you see some of the pictures of the stuff he does big giant boilers and all kinds of nasty, crusty boilers in New York City, dungeons, <laughs> basements. Uh, yeah, that's similar, to what, that's similar to what you do, isn't it, Brian? So I do the uh, air conditioning side of that. So we're in basically a lot of the same buildings type thing, but uh, I'm keeping them cool, and he's making them hot. So uh, we make you cool, and he makes you hot. So it uh, depends on what you're feeling. So uh, well, no, 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 no. As funny as that is, I've heard that when you do AC, you always, always work in the hottest fucking places in the building so it's kind of a oxymoron but i mean i'm hot as can be where i'm at but. yeah yeah cooking in someone's boiler room <laughs> like disgusting but um but yeah no actually we're usually we're in the commercial office buildings and at that point we're putting ductwork in but the building usually is is an occupied building so and a lot of times there's some sort of ac on the floor so it's not too bad um but uh yeah you're stuck in a boiler room with steam and whatnot so it's always hot down there yeah, it's gross yeah that's so what what gold can you bring to the show tonight, Greg? What should we talk about that your business is having in common that we can uh, pull some stuff out of here to share with your brothers in Apex? Um, I mean, I don't know that the business is necessary. I mean, it's a cool business. A lot of people don't know about it. Um, I'm kind of underground. You know, I always kind of joke that I'm like a superhero kind of pops in and out of these buildings. People don't even know the equipment that they have in their buildings. <laughs> You know, I, I've always joked around and said that people think that there's some hamsters in the basement on a hamster wheel, and that's how the heat gets created in the building. They have no clue. Yeah. And I can't sneak in and out of the basements. They don't even know I'm there. But somehow, miraculously, they have heat at their radiators. But, you know, for me, I think more importantly is the journey to get here um, that I think is more interesting. I think people would, you know, yes. maybe relate to, maybe not relate to that I think. Let's go there, man. Yeah. Self-made, man. Self-made right here. Tell us the story. Yeah. Sure. Um, I was on my own at 17, pretty much right out of high school. Just like a lot of people, I was a kind of a shithead kid. I uh, made a lot of shitty decisions, uh, but my parents also made the decision to kind of give me the boot. So I had about $20 in my pocket and trying to figure out 
where to go, where to live, where to stay. I kind of bounced around a little bit. I was sleeping on uh, friends' couches, and I had a work van. I had started doing construction, um, so I was living in and out of the work van. And I, 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 It was a very shitty time for about five years I did that. And uh, bounced around a lot, lived uh, in some pretty horrendous situations, um, had to hustle. Always been entrepreneurial, but I was uh, always hustling. Um, I mean, can I, I, I can be candid here, right? I mean, yeah, we're all talking. Yeah, so um, I hustled drugs for a while. Yeah. Uh, that's how I kind of got through a lot of stuff. That's where a lot of my money came from. That's how I was able to kind of sustain that's it. Uh, it's it's buying and selling and providing a service. I mean, it's it's really, you know, it's just the product you're selling is, uh, you know, not <laughs> legit. But, I mean, it's all the same principles. We talk about this a lot in Apex. There's a lot of people that are ex-drug dealers, and you got a lot of hustle on you. And, you know, you know how to market. You know how to stay underground, but still promote. And you know how to get your supply and sell your supply and make your money. And, I mean, you're running a business, and, you know, by, the, yeah. by accident almost, you know. Um <laughs> You know, I mean, not that we want to promote a, that, but I mean, a lot of people don't through that. Books. It's just like anything else. You got to stay on top of your stuff. It's definitely a hustle. Yeah. Honestly, it's more of a hustle and a, and, and a frustration doing that than it is doing what I'm doing now. You know, the looking over your shoulder stuff and all that stuff is kind of, yeah, that's um, they can get to you, it's yeah. hard. You know, it's funny when we were talking earlier today, it started to make me think of a story which turned my thing around, which I stopped doing that because I used to hustle weight when I was younger. And I, I didn't have my, I had my license suspended like three years prior, but I was driving my aunt's like Ford Escape around. And that's how I was deli- making my deliveries and stuff. And one time I was delivering like 10 pounds or something like that. I had them vacuum sealed and I had them in a garbage bag. I had them in the back of the car. And whoever I brought them to, we weren't able to make it happen. So I was driving home and I got pulled over. And I remember thinking to myself, shit, like this is it. Like all this running around, all this running in the streets, all this doing this shit is about to catch up on me right now. Because like I said, my license, I had a valid ID, but the license was suspended. So the minute that cop would have got to his car, he would have looked up the ID. He would have seen. What'd you get the, uh, what'd you get the, uh, what'd you get pulled over for, man? Uh, Well, so I got to get to that. I didn't get pulled over for anything specific. When the cop came to my window, he asked me for my ID. I, he didn't say anything else, and he turned around, and he walked back to his car. As he got to the car, he didn't even sit in the seat. He turned around and came back to my window and was like, uh, gave me an apology and said that you fit the description of someone we're looking for, and you're not him, and we apologize. He gave me my ID back, and I went on my way. God was on your side that night. Huh? I said, God was on your side that night. I ain't doing this shit no more. That's like, this is a sign. That's the end of it. And I got home and I just started digging in. I had already been building houses. I was in construction. Um, it was all off the books. There was really no future in it other than like doing my own thing. And I had done side jobs, but it really wasn't panning out. And then my family kind of approached me because my stepfather was in the business for like 50 years and asked me if I wanted to get involved in the business. Now, understanding the fact that our relationship was frayed for a very long time. I actually built that relationship back over the years of meeting with them over and over again and just basically showing that I was growing up and I wasn't the same knucklehead that I used to be. And I apologize for a lot of shit that I did. Um, They didn't really throw an apology back my way, but who gives a shit? And we met at that time. It's important to own it. You know, you got to own it. We talk about that all the time. Yeah, I mean, I was 17 years old, bro, 16 years old. I didn't know shit. I had a lot of issues growing up, a lot of anger problems. So uh, we were able to kind of mend the fence. I went back to work. I went to work for him and started learning the boiler business. So that's kind of when this whole thing started. How long ago was that? Huh? How long ago was that? That's about, let's see, I think this year I'm going to be 14 years in the business, 13 or 14 years. So about 13 or 14 years ago. (laughs) So uh, things were all right. And then things started to take a turn because him and I had a history and that history started to reoccur. Mm -hmm. As I started to learn and I started to go out on my own, he started maybe started to feel a little threatened. I'm not really sure. And things really just, we just were like a lot of people that work in family businesses. I mean, I was reading and I was listening to podcasts and all types of stuff about family, but trying to figure it out. Just was not a. It it's was tough, not tough. working. I'm, I'm in family yeah, business too. We, we've had our know, moments. Yeah, know. we've had our moments. Yeah, 
I mean, I don't know what your relationship with, with your dad is like, but for me, man, it's... That's good now, but I was, I was strained at one point because, uh, you know, it was just a little power struggle or push and take and whatever you want to call it. And it's hard, you know, you're with each other every day, you're with each other for every holiday, you're with each other on the weekends and whatever. And it's like, uh, you know, you wind up carrying stuff home that you shouldn't from work and it just it just grows and, you know, different stuff happens. And we had a, we had a falling out a bunch of years ago and we kind of made the fences and we're good now. Um, but it's yeah. definitely it's tough working with family, you know, and then, you know, it's, we're extended. My sister works with us. Uh, my uncles work with us. It's, it's, there's a whole bunch of us there, but we all get along. It's, it's pretty good. It was probably one of the hardest things I had to do because I carried a lot. I mean, you know, I talk about it a lot here in our, in our groups, right? In Apex, um, about holding on to shit and how that affects you. And for a mm -hmm. long time, I, Probably only up until about four, four or five years ago when I really started to, like, dig into myself and learn. I carried so much of this mm. burden, weights on me, and I was always blaming them. And I had right to blame them for shit. They, they were not right either. Mm. I mean, 17-year-old kid, I couldn't even imagine. I mean, even as messed up as my kids might be, I, I, I don't see how I could ever do that because more for me is about teaching and trying to show them the way. And I wasn't really given any guidance growing up. I was just kind of like... Running amok and doing was, stupid shit. It was different back then, though. I mean, we all, I mean, when I think about what I did, I mean, I was running around the streets and not that I was, you know, selling drugs or anything like that, but I was out, <laughs> I was out all hours of the night, young ages, riding my bike everywhere. No one cared where I was. There was no cell phones. I mean, I'd be gone for days, you know, days, but hours, you know, till late at night and skateboarding and riding bikes and doing all that kind of stuff. And I think about it now. My kids run around the streets with, you know, with a cell phone now. I'm like, no way. Like, no. But uh, it's a I, world. I don't, I don't think I could could survive now politically or in business if they had cell phones when we were teenagers. Oh, the yeah, amount yeah. of trouble we got into oh, and yeah. stupid things we did. Sure. Um, you know, I'm just banking on my 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 parents not listening to this. <laughs> <laughs> but boy, if we'd had, I mean, yeah. could you imagine if the shit we'd done had been documented? Yes. yes. Oh yeah. We We'd oh, all, thank you. <laughs> we hope you interrupt. Trust me, there's a lot of things, as much as my parents do know that they don't know. Now, I'm a, I, just, yeah, but like, I texted you guys earlier, I'm an open book. Yeah. And my mother and I have finally mended a, a, a long suffering relationship, and we do talk about things. Do I let her know that I was in the streets and I was hustling? doing? The, she's not stupid either. She knows I was out there, you know, doing whatever. I, and at the end of the day, as far as I'm concerned, looking back on it, it was survival, man. You do what you oh, have yeah. to do. I had an opportunity to present itself, and I took full advantage of it because why not? You know, the money was good. That's a stressful, but what that's happens, that's though? We, started, you know? right. we, all, we all saw the opportunity to make money, and whether it was flipping cars, and me and Sam talked about it in our podcast. We flipped cars. We mowed lawns. We, we, if you saw it, we shoveled snow. You know, probably not in Texas, but up here, we'll show you shoveled snow. I that's literally it. shoveled. I literally shoveled horse shit. There you go. I mean, like, it's like... How can uh, I, I'd rather money? I want something, you know, my dad yeah. used to be good to me because he's like, oh, you want a new TV for your bedroom? So he'd give me like, he'd go buy it and he said, you're going to pay me off and make me payments. So every time it snowed, I'd give him money. Every time, you know, this would give him money. And it was kind of like, kind of taught me how to like borrow and pay stuff back. And then if you want it, you got to hustle for it. And uh, so I did. I mean, I sold and bought and sold everything I can get my hands on. Pulled stuff out of the garbage and sold it. We see opportunity and we say, I can make money on this. Let's do it. So I mean, the drugs are nothing different than that. I mean, it's just the risk factor that you're taking and, you know. But yeah. it's, it's the same the same idea. It's like, you know, are you, ready, are you willing to take that risk for the reward? And that's everything we do in life, right, is risk first reward, right? Every time we open a business and spit, lay out a lot of money, right, and, and hire a bunch of guys and do all this other stuff, it's a risk first reward, you know? Are we going to make it, you know? So it's all the same family. For a long time, the risk was worth the reward until that moment. And, that, yeah. you know, listen, after that moment, and I did, like, a couple little small things, like little fast small things that really – just because I had already still had the contacts with certain people, but those big things that those contacts that I had that I just, I passed those off to somebody else. Um, and then they were still paying me for it, but I took a huge cut. I just was like taking a little bit just for kind of setting up the transaction with somebody else. But I just, I couldn't, uh, I couldn't deal with that in my mind anymore. It's just yeah. like, you know, I wasn't even trying to be locked up for what, you know, it's not even worth it. You know, so the money in that game was good, but it wasn't like, shit, man, I'm going to be in a mansion in six months. It was, yeah. you know, you I was having fun. I was an idiot, too. Like, I just was out. Mm -hmm. 
go here, go in the club, spending. It wasn't like I, I, I didn't have anything to show for it at the end of the day. Yeah. So, you know, it's all yeah. kind of wor- not worthless. It's in the life experience. But um, well, I taught you a lot about business, though, right? I mean, if you think yeah. about it, I mean, I learned a lot about business from all my, you know, like I said, buying and selling cars and all the stuff I did. And like I said, I used to mow lawns and have a bunch of lawn accounts and, you know, again, whatever we could do to make money. But, you know, you learn customer service. I worked in a deli when I was in sixth grade and all the way up through and worked in a car upholstery shop in college and learned that side of the business. And every experience we've had through life helps us where we are today. I mean, that's why we think the way we do. That's why we do the things we do. It's all, and all those people that taught us. I mean, I had a lot of mentors. Was Harold Peterson was in the, the deli, Peterson's Deli back in sixth grade. He taught me a lot about business and customer service and rotating your stock and all the basic stuff. And and uh, Jim Zavada at the Phoenix Auto Pulse, he taught me how to about billing and and uh, you know order materials and and, and schedule and work and, and all this stuff that we did as kids. Like that's why we are who we are. And I think it's important to get our kids out there early to start doing this. I feel like already, um, you know, my daughter's turning 14 and actually she's got a job at the swim school, which is kind of cool. Kind of proud that she's starting to work and make money early because that's how we get somewhere. You know, if you know we think about back in high school when kids had a fancy car that dad bought for them um they beat the crap out of it and in the cars that we had that we worked every weekend for and doing whatever we had to do to drive you took care of it you washed you waxed you changed the oil you know you didn't let your friends sit on it and all this other stuff and it just teaches you respect for you know when you when you work for it you respect it and uh you know i think it's uh, important for the kids to get out there and they're not doing what we did every one of us was hustling at you know 14 years old right yeah. i mean at 14 years old we were hustling you know Hey, I'm trying phone. to get I'm trying to get my kids to uh, to learn that, and you know, William wants a gaming computer, and I, I pay him to do stuff, and he wants the computer, but he doesn't want it enough to do the stuff that I'm paying him to do. Yeah. Um, you know, I could go drop money and get him a gaming computer right now, but that kind of defeats the purpose. Yeah. And in six in six months, he's managed to save sixty dollars and. I'm like, buddy, you got to go quicker than this. <laughs> but where do you draw the line as a parent at teaching a lesson and giving your kids shit because you couldn't afford it when you were a kid? Because I've got this overwhelming desire because I couldn't afford a gaming computer when I was a kid. This is overwhelming desire to go, there you go, boy, go play with that. I think maybe hey, where do you draw that though, line? You know, maybe it's grades. Maybe it's something that they're doing, you know, where they hit achievements that maybe you can, you know, it's like. A it, it's difficult happens, though because he's. You know, but, He's always made A's. Like he never comes home with, with bad grades. So um, I actually pay him for his grades now too. But he decided to spend his grade money on other stuff. Oh, so he's got to learn, right? I don't know, man. I I, I we this is a, a conversation that goes on. I think in every household across this country and across over the in the entire world, because <laughs> no one's able to figure out the enigma of children. You know, yeah. I I think the best that you you know for us like here we look you see their achievements right mm-hmm. you for me the, for me the biggest lesson as a parent has been not when they're home because kids are always pushing the parents that's just what they do they're always trying to see how much patience you have <laughs> my biggest my biggest thing is when they go to other people's houses never once in the the time i've been you know with these kids have i ever heard one negative thing from one parent when Same. they've been over at the mm-hmm. house always yeah. respectful always helpful always all the things that you would expect out of your child and to me that's the big benchmark you know all the other yeah. stuff is a, is a work in progress you have to one of the things that i learned like because i was uh well, i'm also on the lines then so sean whalen always talks about kids you cannot tell your kids what to do because they never want to listen to you the best way to get through to them is to show them mm-hmm. so by your daily actions right you get mm-hmm. up every day i get up every day i work my ass off I have a morning routine. They see I'm at the gym early every single day. I very rarely miss one. They always see me working out. They always catch me reading. Yeah, they see me reading and they make fun of me. They call me a nerd. They say all these things. But the reality is they're seeing it. Mm-hmm. They're seeing me put the work in. They're seeing me go to work every yeah. day. They're seeing me work hard. And in turn, as time evolves, I've seen that they have that same type of work ethic. It may not happen when I want it to. <laughs> and it may not happen when I ask. Yeah. But you see it transitioning over and that goes for you know, your employees in your company right i mean if they know that you're willing to get in there you know elbows deep in that boiler and get covered in grease and whatever else you know they respect you and they work hard don't tell me you can't do it because i'll get in there next to you and if i can do it i don't need you anymore you know it's uh 
you know, you lead by example. I mean, it, there's many times where I go on a job site and I jump on a ladder and do something and I'm like, you know, in, in dress clothes. Because I'm like, all right, well, this needs to happen and you're not doing it right, so I'm going to do it for you type thing. And, you know, stop complaining and get it done, you know. It's like, and that means something. I'm like, oh, shit, this guy knows what he's talking about. Like, you know, I find a lot of, just like, just like kids test you, the employees test you. And they want to see how far they can push you. And, um, you know, it's, it's really, you know, obviously some are better than others, but, um, you know, we're blessed. Actually, we got a great crew, but through the years, I mean, guys test you, you hire a new guy and they see what they can get away with and they keep pushing and pushing and pushing until you catch them. And then, Oh, I didn't know. Well, you knew, <laughs> you know, you knew you were playing a game just like our kids do. It's really the same. I think it's probably human nature, I guess. Right. Um, you know, with authority and, uh, you know, see what you can get away with, with authority. It's funny you bring that up too, because my partner um, in the business is more of the, um, he's like does all the filing stuff. He's, he, he does more of that stuff. Although he, ha he wrote, he's been riding with me for two years um, to go on a lot of jobs. So I've been teaching him a lot about the mechanical side. But in the beginning, when we first started the business, all my guys had such a thick, heavy respect for me because I actually, they transitioned over from my father's. It's another story that I guess we can touch on. <laughs> since we're all talking about it, but um, they were not showing him the same respect that they were showing me. And, they're, and for exactly the reason you were talking about, they know that I've been in the trenches. They know that I'll, I'll pull, you know, pull the wrenches out if I have to. They know that I'll climb inside the boiler if I have to, like literally inside the boiler, because I don't care what has to get done. Yep. And when we have our meetings, I'm always like, listen, I will never ask you to do something I either haven't done or I'm not willing. Because this way they know that if they call on me and they have, like one of my guys is hefty. He's really good at what he does. He's a great worker, but he can't fit. And the size of the hole to go inside <laughs> the actual boiler is so small he can't fit. There's been many times I climb in, I do what has to be done. It's the yeah. hottest, nastiest, tightest, most uncomfortable environment you can think of. But that's the nature of the game, oh, you know? So. You should hire someone to climb in there for you, man. I know, man. I know. No, Other but in a pinch. Doing, I'm just making a point, okay? No, but like you said, there's like, that time like goes What you want to do, right, is, is, is go to... Where's the nearest horse racing track to you? Now? Belmont? Yeah. Belmont, okay. I think. Yeah. What you need to do is go to Belmont, mate. Go out back, find a few jockeys that have had a crappy <laughs> career and need some extra money, <laughs> and get the ones that are shoveling the shit in the back and pay them more because jockeys right they're really wiry they're all already in a bad mood anyway so they'll be really 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 pepped up to get in there and start <laughs> scrubbing and cleaning shit out you can just put them in the boilers it'll be great yeah. no? come yeah. on man a lot of times <laughs> it's, it's you're in a pinch though right so there's something going down it's got to get finished and like there's no time to go get a smaller guy i'm here and i can make it work i mean you know what though you remind me a lot of my brother like who is hugely successful in his work and yet you'll find him like jumping out of bed at 11 o'clock at night to go and fix something for a client because nobody can do it quite as well as he can that's what you remind me of well i'm trying to train people to do it quite as well as i can and i do have a few guys so i've been blessed that way but uh, i used to hop out I, before when i was working for my father that was the kind of shit i have to do the phone would ring at 12 o'clock and i was the one jumping out of bed and you know unfortunately living on long island and having my buildings in the city it's an hour in each direction. Yeah, you so should have like, a good day. <laughs> you, you, what you should have done was have a son about 22 years ago. You could be yeah. delegating this to now. Well, I have one. He's 15, and I'm trying to get him. <laughs> getting it, getting it. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I offered him a job this summer, and he turned me down. And then, like, three quarters of the way through the summer, he's like, yeah, you still uh, offering? I'm like, you're going back to school in, like, a week and a Wait, half. You let bro. him turn it down? Yeah, now, you know. I was going to work with dad since I was like five and, you know, sweeping the shop and stuff, you know. Here's the broom. Clean I it up, it. Yeah. Every summer, every it. weekend. I was always there. It's a really cool business, man. Honestly, yeah. like, if it wasn't for the traveling, I'd love it that much more, you know. Like, I really enjoy what I do. It's been really bad, I do bad, want to lead myself out of being in the boiler room just because it's, you know, it's a lot. And I'm trying to hire and train guys, but, man, I do love it. I mean, it, there is something gratifying about so a building with you know 150 families with kids and elderly and all that stuff mm -hmm. and they run out of heat and they have no hot water and i'm the guy that comes in and, and restores that for them you know there's something um you know one thing i've always carried with me is that in, in my heart to be able to help people like that so uh, you know no, something a strong in about that, that I enjoy huh? just expand on my ignorance here for a minute does is it just like one 
source for hot water in a whole building? Um, some buildings have multiple sources for hot water, but usually there's one heating plant. That's what I Wow. Work. So you're, you're talking about... Um, a locomotive in the basement. That are about 12 to 15 feet tall and maybe 50 to 60 feet long and have humongous equipment on it burning, you know, ridiculous amounts of uh, a ridiculously large size flame inside to heat the water up. It's a, it's a very cool, it's something you, it blows people's minds when they see, they look at pictures, the pictures really don't do it justice, but the, when I bring people down for the first time and they see equipment, they're just like, what the f- is this? Like, what, yeah. this is what you do all day? I'm like, this is what I do all day. I, I never even it. thought about it, mate. Yeah. I thought like, you know, well, I'm saying, nobody just, thinks when it's cold, it. when it's cold, you just twist a little knob on the wall from cool to heat. That's yeah, it. That's, it. that's it. all what you have to think about. What happens when the heat doesn't come up though? And and you shout, you, you shout at somebody. Broken, but then you call me, and then I go down there and I fix, it. I tinker with it. Right, but like per unit, per unit, generally what we see down here in condos and apartment buildings is like legitimate water heaters in every unit. You're dealing with buildings that are older than that technology. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And it blows my mind that this shit even exists. Like I would not imagine that that entire building would have one water heating plant, but it makes sense. Yeah. And they run yeah. uh, coils up and That's they put it on ductwork. Right. Well, it's the same thing. Yeah. I work on coils, just not in ductwork. It sits inside the boiler water and the boiler water heats and it heats up that water going in and out. Mm-hmm. And there's a whole bunch of other stuff. I mean, right. I go on, I'm like a geek when it comes to this. Well, stuff. then that water goes up the pipes to the floors and it goes through the ductwork, the AC ductwork that we put in, they put hot water coils in there. So they turn the AC off and they run the fan past the hot water coil and they use that to heat the floors too. So no that's shit. how they transfer the heat from the basement up to the floors. So sometimes they have radiators around the outside, like typically like a house would have, but it's all different. Ways. Is that like a radiator, but with yeah. a different accent? Yeah, definitely. Say again. <laughs> what did you say? Ra- wow. Goodness. <laughs> <laughs> Um, it's interesting, man. you know, most of these buildings are like from the 50s and 60s. Yeah, yeah, you, know? I mean, old. you know, it's old, old, old now, steam. You deal with uh, steam from Con Ed? Now, Con Ed puts out steam. No, nah, I don't right? deal with city. None of my buildings have city steam. City steam is really only like in the schools and some of the more public places. And none whole, of the buildings whole different have. Concept. How does steam work, man? So, they, so, so Con like, Edison like, sends steam out to the buildings and they, they use this. The Con Ed, rather than giving you gas or rather giving you electric, they give you steam. And Does the steam, steam go cold though? Uh, no, I mean, I guess it, it moves enough cold. that it doesn't. Uh... High, they run it at high pressures, and there's underground lines that go to these buildings, and that's what heats the building. So there isn't even a plant in the building; it's delivered from their main facility at a high pressure through a bunch of pipes, and then certain buildings have this delivered directly to their buildings, and that's what heats the building up. If you see the you know, pictures in the city with the steam coming out of the street, like you always see that yeah. all the time, that's what that is. That's a pipe leaking. That sounds excessively complicated. It is. <laughs> but um, it, when, when you think the only other option is like setting fire to stuff, like, huh? well, fr- from a technological standpoint, mm. like steam came in between electric and setting fire to stuff. Yeah. Like actually having heating fires or cooking fires. Steam Didn't steam come next? I'm not sure yeah. if it came next. I know that the technology is so old and like I, I, I've done so much research on this because I find it interesting, like where this whole thing started. And honestly, they used to just run these things like uh, at six, like crazy poundages. If you look it up in history, there's been boilers that literally just blew out of the side of buildings because they just had no regulation on them and stuff like that. Now it's like a safety on a safety on a safety on a safety on a safety to back up another safety and safety safety's everywhere. The whole thing is a safety. So yeah, before safeties, I mean, that thing could boil over, and that pressure could keep building, and really, it's a bomb, you know. And that happened on ships. That was where a lot of it started. On 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 the boilers I work on are called Scotch Marine boilers. They started on ships. That's how they were they were first created, and they were used on different ships, cruise ships, and things like that, battleships. And they used to just feed a furnace with either coal or fire, and they used to keep these. the flame inside perked up constantly. Like if you ever watch documentaries, like on the Titanic was the same thing. They had just guys just shoveling coal inside to the furnaces and they were steam. It was all steam generated. Well, the old locomotives, the same thing. Yeah. They used to have a perk of fire in the old locomotives. Yeah. Get steam generated. And that's how they get used to get the things rolling. 
So it's, I mean, they use it in so much technology and I just learned a lot about it. I'm still learning a lot about it as puns. Yeah, it's definitely cool. It's cool. Stuff. Yeah, the, uh, the British uh, agricultural revolution was steam powered. Um, it, it was not internal combustion at all. We had steam, uh, steam tractors well into the 20th century. So, uh, yeah, it's fun it's to look at. It's fairly efficient when everything, I mean, to me, it, what's hard is that a lot of these systems are not set up properly, so that's why they're not that efficient. But when you have everything right, man, it's one of the best systems that there are, in my opinion. You know, but are you seeing uh, a lot of oil still now because they had that local law, or whatever, when they're changing everything from oil to gas and energy yeah. efficiency codes and stuff? What, what do you generally yeah, work a lot on? Of stuff. A lot of people are decommissioning here, but I'll tell you that the the trick I teach my client, my clients, do not get rid of your oil because on the flip side of the oil is the gas. And the gas companies, because I don't, and I don't know if you've seen, they've been in the news, but there was a couple of huge explosions over the last like six, seven years in the city where people passed away and they were gas related. But that was only from negligence. People were piping illegally yes. and then there were leaks and there was explosions. But now the gas company got so crazy. They go into buildings. They f smell one thing. They're shutting buildings down. And when they shut a building down and you lose gas to the heating plant, if you don't have oil, I can't give you heat or hot water. Mm. I can't do anything. Then they have to bring in mobile boilers. That's another thing we yeah. have by us. They basically bring a big ass eighteen wheeler with a boiler inside of a container. They run hoses and across they the sidewalk and, and yeah. you eat that way. That's pretty it's wild. wild. Yeah, it's wild. Yeah. But anyway, well, we take that stuff for granted. But if you if you didn't, I mean, the stuff we see is uh, it's definitely wild. It's cool. It's yeah. cool, man. The tractor trailer pulls up and it's a it's a boiler on wheels and they pipe it into the building and they basically hot wire the uh, the building to make heat. With uh, with a boiler, uh, it doesn't no, normally get oh my, doesn't man. normally get cold here, you know, so we don't have to worry you don't about have that, that problem. Yeah, no, yeah. It, it did this year. Cold. This year, the, like the coldest in twenty years. This year, yeah. that's because Thomas uh, we, brought New York's weather down with him. Yeah, it's yeah, it was Thomas's fault. Yeah, no yeah, we get nine degrees. Ridiculous. Yeah, we don't even get nine degrees snow. up here. <laughs> now you get um like dual fuel stuff too, right, Greg? It's uh oil yeah, and gas. Yeah, most of my stuff. Most of my stuff is dual fuel. Hmm. It's mainly gas. Some people got rid of the oil. Most of the people are still dual, but the oil very rarely runs. But it's, you know. They use a lot for, uh, well, the diesel for the emergency generators. We do a lot with that a lot of times. They put, same thing, like a tractor trailer up on the roof of the building that's a generator. And they put these giant, giant diesel tanks in. And uh, they run these diesel generators. Um, and we build um, tank rooms, basically. We've actually metaled the rooms out to make them like a big drain pan in case the, in case the oil leaks. Mm -hmm, uh, mm -hmm. It won't contain some, it. Yeah, that's some wild stuff. And then piping the exhaust out. Sometimes they're in the building, you have pipe the exhaust out. Big giant radiators, like big giant car radiators. Sometimes they have them like in a in a room up on a roof. They got louvers that open up, and so we do a lot of work with that and duck that into the louvers and all kinds of dampers, motorized dampers that go on and off. And yeah, we deal with some wild stuff when you think about it. That uh, you know, well, you're in the basement, up on the roof a lot because a lot of the AC units are up on the roof. So I've been on the roof of some pretty cool buildings. You know, I can, yeah, see, I can see my house from here. <laughs> yeah, it's pretty wild. Cities, listen, man, all politics aside, the city is a cool place. It really is. It really is. No, a little fucked up right now, but... Uh, What's yeah. going on with the fuckery up there? Because I don't even get second secondhand news reports that tell me I need a I need a, a card to go in a restaurant. Is that really happening? Or is yeah, it just you got to show, show your card to go in, yeah. In Manhattan. Outside, like when I'm in Brooklyn, I go to restaurants. They don't really break. I mean, you shouldn't say this out loud. You know, they'll start cracking down. But um, they, yeah. they. No, I'm, I'm interested to know, like, because yeah, all man, I, I, I get is I don't man, know anybody. Can't go. Some of the places will just deal with the picture of the card. A lot of places are going deep. They have like an app. I mean, it's fucking out of control. Man. The cards are a joke, though. Like, I, I got vaxxed and I got the card, and it says absolutely nothing. It says my name and the two vaccines I took with the with the code on them. And it doesn't say uh, Social Security, doesn't have a picture, doesn't have a hospital number, doesn't have nothing. It's just a piece of paper. So I'm like, like really, anyone could use my card. Like, it's just so, such a game. But that's a whole other topic. You know, I wanted to, to address um, the situation, how I got into my starting my company. You know, something that is very interesting, might be helpful to some people. Because I'm sure a lot of people in Apex are, are in family-run businesses. One of the things we were kind of touching on before. And I... Like part of that journey where I was telling you, I started with my family and I had actually left like three or four years in and I went and got a job in another company in Queens and I worked there for like three years. After those few years, I gained like a crazy amount of knowledge and my parents came back to me again 
were like, yeah, he's getting ready to retire. We want you to come back. So I went back. I was, I put a, a good four years in busting my ass because I was told that I was going to be handed the keys to the, to the company. And that's kind of how my journey to taking, to running my own shit started because I was like, all right. So I started to learn the customers, started to learn the business, like the real part of the business, the customer stuff, the pricing jobs and all that stuff. And it turns out, and this is where it gets good as far as a story is concerned, is that in the last like six months leading to when I left the company, because eventually I obviously left, my father's like, yeah, 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 I'm going to take my stepfather. He's, I'm going to take care of you. I'm going to take care of you. I'm going to take care of you. The business is yours. Boop, 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 boop. He starts firing people left and right. So I'm like, why would this guy burn the company down if he's about to hand it over to me? Son was a little fishy. I really didn't understand where he was going with it. So then he started breaking my balls over every fucking thing. And I started to see the writing on the wall. So I actually, my partner now worked at that company. That's how we met. He worked there for a year even before I came back. And he learned a lot of the um, stuff that he does with us. <clears throat> and when he got fired about a few months, a few weeks later, I saw what he was doing and I got out of there. I gave him all his shit back, car, credit card for the company, the whole nine yards. And we had a huge falling out. Anyway, about four months after that, he, I had found out that he was, he had been trying to sell the company all along and basically sold the company out from underneath me. And I'll tell you how that all happened, right? So along the way, we did co communicate again and he had heard that uh, customers were reaching out to me, but I was, they had a couple of customers reach out to me that were his and I told them flat out, I was like, listen. I'm not working there anymore. You need to call him. I wasn't trying to backhand him. I didn't do anything shady. <clears throat> and he called me and he was like, listen, I know that I want to help you out. I'm getting out of the business one way or another. But just do me a favor. Stay away from the customers for now. I'm like, well, I'm not going to the customers. So don't worry. He's like, all right, cool. He's like, when the time comes, I'm going to push the customers your way and, and, and you're going to be all set. But just, you know, back off of it a little bit. And I had this conversation with him two or three, at least two times. I think it was a third time. Meanwhile, the whole time as he's telling me this, he's working out a deal behind me because he wanted to keep me from the customers, which I wasn't going after them anyway. Anyway, he sold this company to some douchebag and the douchebag didn't know shit about the company. And then I ended up with all the customers eventually. I mean, this is, uh, I'm speeding up the timeline for story shit because there's no reason. That happens a lot though, where, you know, basically that the, the head guy moves to the next company and all the guys and all the customers, all the workers and all the customers follow. I mean, you know. They wouldn't uh, have. They wouldn't yeah. have had the guy that came in knew something. But, he uh, was an was asshole, first of all. And he also didn't treat the guys right. So he wasn't able to maintain the workforce. And the customers started getting upset. So I ended up with the whole workforce. But that's how I kind of got into my company because my, my partner, who was, had left before I left, I reached out to him. I was like, listen, man, I'm not working for anybody anymore. That's it. Honestly, I had went back to construction for like three, four weeks just to get a little cash flow going because I didn't know what to do in between. So I was working off the books for like a month. I went back to building houses for the guy I was working for before. And I was fucking miserable. I, I, I mean, I did it. I enjoy strapping on the tools and like doing shit, but I wasn't feeling it. And I reached out to him. We had a meeting. That was it, man. I mean, from that meeting, we pretty much were like, yeah, let's do this. And we made one other phone call. And, you know, two, two plus years later, and we we're just crushing it. Um, it's kind of fucking crazy, man. Honestly, it's, uh, you know, talking to you guys and kind of rehashing some of this old stuff and just looking back at being a 17 year old kid and now being, you know, going to be 39 next month and having a business that's two years in, that's just hammering away and making the money we're making. And, 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 and the sky is really the limit with that and having multiple other shit going on and being in apex and, just like life is just so surreal right now. Yeah, exactly. You know, even being, even the ability to sit in here with you guys and tell my story, which I'm super appreciative of the two of you for, uh, you know, allowing me to come on. Great story. You know, yeah, you've, been very, you've been very vocal in uh, Apex in the community, obviously telling your story lately. Sure. We talk about how important it is for people to hear our stories, the good and the bad, you know. It's always not a rainbows and unicorns, you know. There's some stuff, it's tough stuff that's going on in people's lives. That's and, the truth. You know, there's, there's a lot going on behind the scene that we don't let people see. Um, and I think it's important sometimes to let the light shine on that so that someone else that, you know, we call it FYE, right? Fuck your excuses. 
people say, oh, you know, I, I, I had nothing was given to me, you know, whatever, you know, you came from the streets, and now you run a, you know, million dollar business. So, like, anything's possible if you put your mind to it. Um, and it's it's really that, that, that FYE, like, there is no excuses. You had, you know, nope. you started with nothing and got yourself to this point. So, I mean, it's just, it's the American dream, really. I mean, right, people coming from other countries with $20 in their pocket, and next thing you know, they're running companies, they're owning buildings, and, I mean, it's... There's, there's more hustle in, uh, in foreigners than there is in the American people. We all know that. That's, sure, That's a whole other conversation yeah. for another I mean, day. It's, it's wild. Yeah. I mean, yeah. you know, I got friends that literally came here. You know, parents came here. You know, some of them came here. They, most of them were second, oh, the next generation. But came here with literally like $20 in their pockets, $50 in their pockets. Imagine going yeah. to another country. I mean, Sam sort of did it. But going to another country with $20 in your he pocket. And sort of did. Life, well, you came here. You came here playing in a band. It wasn't like you came here with twenty dollars in your right. pocket. Right. So, so I had less. I had less than twenty dollars. Yeah, less. I was, than a, I was a musician. Yeah. I had negative twenty dollars. Don't get it. Don't get you very far. I can tell you that much. Yeah. yeah. Fucking. Sure. You know what, man? Honestly, like I watch people, and I don't know. You know, it's like when you buy a car, and then like you've never seen that car before, but then when you buy the car, you 100%. see the car every fucking way. Right. You find what you so focus like, on. Pretty much, but lately I've been posting a lot of deep shit. I realized that that's my calling and trying to help people is something that um, I'm very passionate about. And as I've gone along this journey, I have a lot to offer people. Now, there are people that have worse stories than me, backgrounds that are fucked up. Um, maybe it's just that I'm vocal and I'm willing to talk about my own shit, but everybody's <laughs> shit is fucked up to them. Right. So, like, I can't compare what I went through to somebody else because everybody had a hard time with whatever they had a hard time with. But what I was getting at is that I've been posting all these things fairly regularly. I've been trying to do one every morning talking about either another story or something that relates. Yeah, now that. I know it. Awesome. I don't know if it was happening before, but now I am noticing a lot of people opening up about their shit. Yeah. And it could be oh, coincidental, yeah. no, but it's I, just, no, it's not. I really enjoy that. I like to see, because yeah. now people say, this is an open forum. I can say what I want and there's no judgment in this group. There's, as there shouldn't be. What the fuck? Yeah. That's one thing that's nice of this group. There, I have not yet heard one person talk down to one to anyone in the group. I mean, it's just that's the cool thing about there. Apex. Yeah. I mean, they wouldn't fuck around with that. No shit, matter they... what you're doing, even if you're screwing shit up, people are gonna be like, "Yo, you're screwing shit up. Let me help you." You know, For sure. it's just it's just an amazing environment. You know, it's hard to explain to people that aren't part of Apex, but uh, yep. come come to a live event sometime and uh, you'll understand. It's it's a different world. But, um, I mean, that, you know, yeah, the realer we get, I actually had um, more than one person reach out. I do my lives every morning. You know, I do messages a day, and sometimes I get a little bit deeper about stuff in my life. Sometimes I'm, you know, half asleep. But you do live videos every day, bro. Yeah, no. Yeah. <laughs> never seen. I've never seen one of those. <laughs> so, uh, but um, I had someone who really reached out and says, "You need to get realer." And I'm like, "What do you mean?" They're like, "You need to go deeper. Like, you need to get deeper. Like, the deeper you get, the more connecting you are with people." And the more the more real it is, the more real it is. It's not you know, don't just fluff messages, like real messages, intentional messages. And I'm like, yeah. shit, you're right. I gotta I gotta dig in more. I gotta I gotta up my game. I mean, this morning my message was I started seventy five hard phase two today because last night I kinda got drunk and some bad stuff went on and um it was time. So I said, you know what? Um keep it real. I said, It's time, it's time. I was drinking too much. I freaking gained like 20 pounds from when I was off 75 hard. And you know what? You get in this funk, and we all have it. We all have different stuff going on in our lives in the background. And it's uh, we self-medicate, and we try and escape, and it's real. Um, we've, a lot of us have been there, and um, you kind of got, got to know it's time. It's time. So we're going to take a month off from drinking. We're going to go on a diet, and I'm going to try and get back to where I was when I came off 75 hard the first time. And um, I'm going to get some clarity again. Um, we talk about... You guys have all done 75. Well, Sam didn't finish, right? Did you, did you do full 75? Yeah, I, did I got through phase two. I, I didn't finish up. Yeah, so, uh, I mean, I'm doing phase two late. Uh, kind of my time expired, but I'm at this point. Suppose I'm going to have to do it, aren't I? You got, I honestly, though, yep, the, do the mental clarity you get out of it is... It's unexplainable. and It doesn't really make sense. I mean, it sort of does, but like it, you really feel like a different person. <clears throat> so... I was kind of craving it. Actually, kind of what kicked it off um, when I was in uh, Tampa at Stacy Resky's event with Mariana. She was doing 75 hard, and we were hanging out at the bar and having a drink. And she's like, I got to do my workout. And walking around Tampa was like 10 o'clock at night. And I'm like, you know, and I was there with Jessica Dennehy. And we're like, we're going to go with you. 
Like, it's like, you're going to do it with me? I was like, yeah. It's like, what we do? Like, you got to go do your workout? We're in. So the three of us walked around Tampa and explored Tampa on a fast walk for 45 minutes and did the workout together. And it was really kind of cool. It's it, In the 75 hard world, there's such a bond, especially if people have done it and understand the struggle and understand how hard that, I mean, I'm going to finish this now and I got to do 45 minute workout still. Um, you know, it's, it's a struggle and like, you want to go to bed after this and now I'm going to go out in the street and run around for 45 minutes, you know, or jump on a treadmill for 45 minutes. And I still got to read my 10 pages and it, it, the struggle is real. Yeah. I'm going to read right after this. You know, yeah, well, does, <laughs> yeah. That, does that count from right me? here? <laughs> you know, so, uh, but once you've uh, done, once you've done it, you understand the struggle that's involved in it. It was really kind of cool to bond and, and, and support her. And then actually the next morning, um, we had Pelotons in, uh, the hotel I was staying in. She had never Peloton before. I hadn't, I had done it that day. So she joined me at the hotel. We jumped into Pelotons and we did the 45 minute on the Peloton, which is, which is a great workout. It's actually kind of cool. What is that? The Peloton? Yeah. The bike, you know, the, uh. Say exercise bike. <laughs> yeah. It's got like a big screen on it. So you can do different types of workouts and then they take you through the mountains and stuff, you know, even though you're really in a hotel gym. You no, know I like it. In, it's actually like a meter. You got to be between between like fifty and sixty, and you got to pedal at that rate to stay in that zone to get your points. Otherwise, you don't get your points. So you can't like. You Dude, know, I can if you play a game. With I can yourself. ride a bicycle. I can ride a bicycle forever, mm. and I lose interest in a freaking exercise bike in minutes. This is different, though. It's, it's, it's the, the most a hot girl boring. Up and down on a bike in front. The of most you. boring thing in the world. No, the, the Peloton's better. Regular exercise bike in a room is uh, it's kind of boring. Actually, honestly, that's why I ride outside. I ride to a destination. There you go. You know, I ride to the water oh, yeah. and I do my live and I ride back and because it's it's not boring, you know. I, I feel like I'm I have a mission. I'm gonna ride there today and then tomorrow I'm gonna ride there and you know, and then I start to, you know, all right, how far can we ride? What what far destination can we ride to? Now the weather's getting crappy, but I used to ride down the Long Beach all the time. How far can you ride? Most I've done is like twenty seven, twenty eight miles. I mean I could do more, but that's that's the most I've ever done in one one day. You should do like a hundred miles. I think I could do it, honestly. That's your goal. That's your next yeah. year's goal I by the end. I could do it. Yeah. It's Yo, a... Sam. Let me ask you: If you had to choose one, treadmill or the bike? A moving bike? No, your stationary bike, like you were just talking about that you were dreading. Ugh. Um, treadmill. Yeah, treadmill. <laughs> That's more exciting. Yeah, yeah. It gives me more to focus on. Um, I figured but, out yeah. that I can read really good on a treadmill. If that makes any sense, so. In my ADHD world, what are you where I'm distracted. Fucking walking at a two. two no, I, I, I crank it up till I'm just about running, like to like a fast walk where you almost have to run, and I just read, and um, I can actually focus. Believe it or not, I actually put the radio on, walk really fast, and I read, and I can comprehend like crazy. If I just try and go sit in a quiet room, read a book, I read the same page three times. My mind is everywhere, so it was actually kind of weird. If I distract my mind, I could actually go into hyper focus and read the book and comprehend. It's a little game I play with myself that I figured out during 75 hard, and I was able to read a whole crap load of books that, you know how many books I got piled up, and if I sit in a quiet room and try and read, I can't because it's, I read the same page three times. I know a lot of people in the ADHD world struggle with the same stuff. You wait till this late in the day to read, bro? What's what's your mornings look like with the 75 hard? Uh, I write at dawn. That's it, though? Like, you get up early? Like, so, uh, like, when I was doing it, one of the things I prided myself on was knocking out as many yeah. things as I could in the morning. It's not to check the boxes off. It's just that yeah, your day gets done. busy. You never know where your day is going to go. Exactly. So I was, like, getting to the gym my first workout, getting a bunch of water slammed down, yeah, taking my picture after the gym, right now. reading my book. Huh? I said I got the water done already. Probably I, I can have, see to, that. have to pee as I'm sitting here right now. But, uh, you yeah, know, you make the free trips to the bathroom. Fun. I used to do fucking live videos when I was on my walks, like just talking about how, how many times a day I had to pee. It's fucking hilarious. Yeah, <laughs> I, there's there's yeah, a couple I don't times know like you're like you're in a public place and you got to figure out where to pee outside because it's like I can't hold it anymore. I remember like peeing in an alleyway one time. I'm like I just can't get to anywhere to, near a bathroom, so we're peeing in the alleyway. Yo, this is podcast gold, bro. Yeah. Yeah. There's just, just certain things I don't talk about. Who doesn't yeah. want to listen? To this? Anyone, <laughs> anyone that's done 75 hard knows the struggle. Where are the questions? Does anybody have questions? Is yeah. anybody tuned in? Yeah, what's the question um, coming in? Nothing. Somebody got to ask a question. I know when I have nobody, it. nobody has asked a question. No, I can ask you. I can it's ask you a question if stuff, you, right? I can ask you a question if you like, Greg. Like, no one cares. No one's questioning us. <laughs> it's just so riveting that they're just yeah. locked in. <laughs> no, I can't see. Like, can you guys see? 
you you have it live like on your screen so you can yeah, see yeah i got a screen in the background here watching. yeah i can i've got, I've got a, that's why i keep jumping on the other screen i'm watching a live feed can we had anybody hop in couple but nobody yeah. say anything uh zach siegel said something of course zach's gonna start 75 hard he just doesn't know it yet i'm pushing him that's right i'm gonna suck his ass right in All right zach we're coming for you man we're still watching let me ask you guys have me here is anybody you get do you, either one of you have anything based off of the things that we said that you're curious about yeah loads of stuff um like shit what's the future look like for greg where are you going i know you got some uh you got some big ideas and another brand you got a, a mail out box coming don't oh, you yeah, we're yeah, about that. yeah. We're, uh, like, the barbecue barbecue subscription box which is supposed shit. To cool. you know i'm a good host dude i just can't get fucking word in sideways with you two talking <laughs> you just gibber all the time like we i could i tried to keep this podcast on topic about six minutes into it i just gave up <laughs> i've just been riding along with you guys oh, yeah. it's a fun ride. sometimes it takes a life of itself man, you, know, you know so yeah but i I've, I've i've stalked your facebook i i knew what i wanted to ask you but um i'm i'm kind of liking just that living podcast right now at the minute just seeing where they go so um yeah i did want to hear about your future because you just wrapped up an apparel company not too long ago and you've started a subscription box company yeah isn't that right yeah. So tell us, tell us about this uh, this amazing side hustle that you got going on. So um, we, I have a partner in this also. He actually brought it to me. He lives down in New Orleans, but um, the idea was and is we went around the country through. I mean, I was Facebook and Googling. We found the top competition sauce and rubs um, in the country. So we found about ten guys right now that are signed up for the next ten months. Mm -hmm. to do um they won like some of the biggest barbecue competitions in the country uh with their sauces and their rubs that they make so we're basically going to be packaging up two sauces and a rub into a subscription box mm -hmm. which you pay monthly like any other subscription box and every month we're going to bring you a new chef or pit masters sauce and rubs and they're all competition uh level stuff like they've all won awards multiple awards um yearly awards they're, they're they're pretty big names in that world so uh, we could have we had some guys lined up that were had some good stuff but we we took it another angle um so that's 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 basically it i mean the the, the site is set up uh we're just like in testing mode right now and how'd you come up how'd you come up with the idea for sources and rubs was this one of the the your partner's ideas or was it something you're passionate about yeah i i've always been like I was never into competition barbecue, but I've always been a guy. I mean, I'm a man. I like I'm food. Yeah, we all like food, and I always, <laughs> use, I always, I'm, a, I'm always on the grill. Mm -hmm. But my partner is the one that came up with the idea. He brought it to me, um, more from an investments perspective in the beginning. Mm -hmm. But I also now I dove into it and have gotten you know deeper into it, and uh, I just think there's a love and a passion for it um, around around the country, around the world. Really, we're going to be able to push it anywhere we want. And I've gotten deeper into it and, and then really enjoying it. And it's just another avenue. And to be clear, I, I, you know, I was talking about this boiler business, even though we're doing really well, my long term is not to be in the business anymore. I'm trying of course, to, yeah. reason why I joined Apex, try to set it up where it's running itself. And I can kind of stay on as a consultant because I really like to get out of New York. So I'm working on these other avenues to bring me, you know, hold my revenue down and, that's pretty much it. You know, I mean, this is the first step. Um, hoping this, uh, our projections are looking pretty good so far. I don't want to talk on numbers yet until I really know, but I feel like that will grow into a lot of different things, you know, whatever yeah. you could do, um, you know, barbecue tools, you could do, uh, you know, maybe get it with a meat thing. Like, uh, what's the, uh, what's the meat company that sends all the, the meat in the box, um, like a butcher box, Omaha steak type thing. Omaha steak. Put your box in a few. box, you know, so like you, you can First, you got to cut a hole in the box, <laughs> and then you put the meat in the box. <laughs> yeah, I mean, we're we're talking about it. We're gonna be doing shirts and different uh, grilling parts, probably with our names. Uh, there's a lot of ways we can like monetize. You, do, uh, it. you can do events too, you know, a grill off yeah. and you know yeah. that type of stuff. I feel like there's the sky's the limit on that stuff, and it does have a cult following. I know a lot of people that are into their barbecue oh, yeah. when it's these people eat, sleep, and you know, die barbecue. Especially people that just go in their backyards that we felt we felt like like if you're like living in, in New York or you're in the Northeast, although I've come to find out that New York is actually one of the top barbecue states in the fucking country, which I find to be 
I'd like to know who did that poll because I don't see how that's even possible. No, we that's, that's, when the weather's warm, I mean, my barbecue goes all year round. Yeah, but you're not doing competitions. Bro. Yeah. I'm talking about competition. When I'm talking, talking about, competition. I'd say better than half of my friends have a smoker in their, you know, in their yard. They're into it that much, you know. Um, yeah. Well, that's what we're hoping, you know, to bring these flavors to people that wouldn't generally have them at their fingertips because they don't even know they exist, first of all. They've been eating, you know, Sweet Baby Ray's all these years, which is not a bad sauce, by the way. But, um, you know, we're, we're, we're trying to bring them something with a little bit better kick and... Now, do you Tons get into of the, uh, like the vinegar style? Like, I know when I go to uh, North Carolina, I got property down there. And uh, when I went to barbecue there, I was like, this is barbecue? Like, like that's how they do it there. It's different. It's different. Yeah. But I think that's one of the nice things about this also, because, like, all the people we met are from all, of the, all over the country. So, you know, there's different styles, different flavors. It's not going to be the but same. There's thing. only one kind of barbecue, and that's Texan. <laughs> yeah. All right. Like, you know, it's just everything else just doesn't yeah. compare. We actually have, I haven't gone to a real barbecue place there yet, though. Dude, I've got a mate, right? And he, he spends days smoking this shit. And then he, he wheels his smoker down the side of the road okay. and he sells it on the side of the road. Why and not? he's got a really, really long beard and all his hair's grown out. And he just decided he liked selling barbecue. And he makes the most fucking phenomenal brisket. And, um, have like. It just falls apart. It's wonderful. It's absolutely Sometimes wonderful. Sometimes it gets too smoky. To die like, for. After you eat it, you feel like you ate it at the fireplace. You know? like it's just... No, 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 no. no. This kid's got it I've, right. I've had some. It's like, ah, oh, it's like this is literally like after you're, you're eating it, like it's just too much smoke, you know? It's like literally. You no, like you've got to come to fire. Texas, mate. Yeah, yeah you've got you to go to the right places. Listen, sure. I think you're neglecting us. You know, we keep coming to Texas. You haven't taken us to uh, any good places yet. So it's all on you now. I think challenge accepted. Sam's taking been us busy. Out. I'm going to no. hold you with barbecue and cigars next time we come down. When are we coming down? January? I believe Sam. so. I'll I'll bring some I'll bring some of my buddy's brisket. How about that? Yeah. I love that. You I'll, I'll pay him, I'll pay him to cook this. a whole one. Yeah. I'll sit in a corner and eat it by myself so no one's trying to get their grubby ass hands <laughs> in my in my food, you know? What's Craig doing over there? Uh he's eating some brisket. Leave him Yeah, I believe it. <laughs> <laughs> you boys are killing me all right what do we have to do before we can wrap this podcast up because i have another recording to do this evening not like you I'm story uh, time with sam i like it is that a peloton behind you greg it's a knockoff called a pro form the pro form with an ipad yeah that's like the i that's like the ikea version you know <laughs> the kmart version. <laughs> the kmart version exactly <laughs> like yeah all right we'll go half we'll go half all right so before we leave greg Greg, where can the people that are watching this find you and follow you on social media, pal? Um, Especially your new barbecue business. Yeah, so the barbecue business is called Prime Barbecue Club. That's on Facebook. And it's also, mm -hmm. I also have an Instagram handle for it. It's just Prime Barbecue Club. Uh, my Instagram's G underscore Michaelman. That's M I C H E L M A N. Brian, thank you. Listen, it auto uh, uh, me. I thought it was spelling, <laughs> spelling micro. And Facebook's also Greg Michaelman. Very easy. I keep it. I don't. I don't. I don't try to hide from the from the public. You know, let people find me. Honestly, I think that's important. Right. That's a message to the public. Keep your keep your stuff consistent because, like, when people go looking for you and you have all different names and then fake names and all this other stuff, with like, you're doing yourself a disservice. We just talked about here on on our Zoom. Make sure you got your full name on Zoom so that when people are in the room with you and they like what you say, they know how to find it. You know. Or you can stuff. find me at Brittany Michaelman. So. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> he signed in as his wife. We're like, who's this? <laughs> only fans something like only that only fans yeah what's your only no, fans like? <laughs> fuckers <laughs> oh there you go well, it's funny there yeah, change there it alright well thank you for watching Good people stuff. and thank you for joining us Greg it's been uh, it's yeah. been my pleasure it's been quite a bit of fun hanging out and chatting with you Brian do you have anything to add before we leave for the evening oh it's all good stuff we uh, had the pleasure of hanging out with Greg uh, what was that last Wednesday was it we uh, yeah we have a a good uh, Apex Northeast crew here, and we get to dinner a lot. And actually, it was just uh, me, Greg, and Todd. We got to share a lot of uh, good stories and close. And I don't know if you saw, we went live on uh, on the Apex page at Thomas Keenan's original stereo site. We uh, we did a live shot from uh, where it all began. So a little shout out to Thomas. It was kind of fun. That's funny. Yeah, I bet he enjoyed cool. that. Yeah, I bet he enjoyed cool. that. Definitely. It's where he became, and God bless him. He's killing it. But um, all right. Yeah, it was good stuff, man. I appreciate you coming on. Um, Lots of knowledge there. And 
your story is amazing, bro. I mean, like, literally, fuck your excuses. Like, I came from the street and I'm running a million dollar business now. Like, what's your excuse, man? Everyone out there, what's your excuse? Get it done. Yep. Well done, man. Let's fucking go. Yes, sir. I appreciate you, gentlemen, too, man. Thank you again. Yes, sir. I really All right. That's first, it. First, first of many, hopefully. So I do appreciate the opportunity. Thank you. Definitely. Thank you. Have you gotten right. on Sam's podcast? Yeah, jump on Sam's podcast, too. I was on so, it. I'll wait for the invite, man. Maybe. Yeah, wait for the invite, damn it. <laughs> yeah, I waited for my invite. Sam, come I don't on. impose on people. They want me on. If you thought it was good, hit me up. Let's do it. I'm down. I got to get out of here. All You'll right. be good. I'll read your book. Thank it's you for listening, guys. We'll see, you ne- we'll see you all next week. All right. All right I'm out of here. Bye. Bye.